<laughs> right, well, I'm going to talk to you about lustreware. We have a, a small collection and I have learned a lot more about it uh, since I started preparing this talk, I'd have to say. Uh, first, an acknowledgement. I have taken pictures from many fellow collectors. I have photographed some in their collections and a lot of people have sent me pictures. Uh, they are so numerous too that I'm not mentioning them specifically, which is a bit of a cop out, I know. And it also means that in the early days, I didn't always keep a very careful record of whose pictures I had. First of all, let's talk about what we mean by lustre glazes. When I looked in the literature and the, I brought up some suppliers of lustre glazes, all sorts of things, I find there are two types. There's the thin overglaze, which is applied at the end, and that gives a very lustrous finish. And that's mostly what Wildman and Shelley used. Uh, it was pretty fragile, so it tended to be used on wares that were for display rather than the utilitarian pieces they made. And there are also some thicker metallic glazes. In these cases, these are Shelley examples. Uh, the ones on the left, I think, are Bob Nickel Smith's. Uh, but uh, I only have pictures of a very few examples. The one on the right was in an Australian collection, but the lady got killed in some bushfires some years ago. And uh, let's start off by looking at the Wildman and Company backstamp period. That's 1898 to 1910. Uh, they, although they built an earthenware factory a little earlier, they didn't seem to do any lustering until about 1898. There are a few styles which we'll look at, and they are all marked with Spano lustra. And some of them have for the thin overglazes, iridescent glaze added as well. Art director Frederick Reed is given the credit for introducing a big range of earthenware when he joined in 1896. In 1905, he was replaced by Walter Slater and uh, Walter Slater is also credited with a few of the later ones. Let's start off with the 3000 series. These are all stamped Spano Lustra. And confusingly, they share patterns and numbers with Intarsio. There are 52 entries in a separate pattern book. And as you can see on the left, uh, the shape is shape 20. The last couple of figures in the numbers normally designate the shape for Intarsio and Spano Lustra of this series, but colored quite differently and they've been given an orange overglaze. Uh, a few more examples. You'll see the Spano Lustra ones at the top and underneath their Intarsio counterparts. Now, Intarsio seems to be much more popular than Spano Lustra, and there are far more examples of them around. And a few more examples, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, an exotic Eastern I think it's a teapot, but if someone wants to cook with a coffee pot, I wouldn't argue. A tobacco jar and uh, a little pot with handles and uh, uh, poultry. And I'm throwing in a couple because these are obviously on the one on the left is Spano Lustra, and it's in their Spano Lustra list of the 52 patterns, but it has just an Intarsio stamp on it. And uh, you can see the Intarsio version, slightly different colors on the right-hand side. And this one is in our collection. When we bought that, I thought it was just an Intarsio variation, but it obviously, it's stamped Intarsio, but it obviously is also meant to be Spano Lustra. On the outside, the orange glaze is somewhat worn, but you can see underneath. So that's the 3000 example. There are quite a few around, but uh, certainly not as common as Intarsio. Next, I'd like to talk about is a 10,000 series. And these are often referred to as arts and crafts style. No surviving pattern book that I know of. And uh, the numbers are scratched in the bottom. Uh, they have obviously been done by hand. And a number of these shapes have at least one or two variations, that is different colors and so on, but you can see follow the same overall pattern. 
Uh, this is 1003. And incidentally, uh, the numbers, the three or the last couple of digits, which in Antasio and a lot of the other things indicate the shape. In this case, uh, three seems to be, it's certainly not the shape used for three for Antasio. And I've thrown in a faience example, which isn't blasted, but just labeled faience. Uh, it's the same shape and it also shares uh, an, a number three at the end, but it's in an 11,000 faience series arts and crafts. And a couple more, you can see quite a wide range of pots, which would appear to have been hand thrown and hand decorated, but more or less to a pattern. And a couple more. And uh, just to finish up on the 10,000 series, here's a couple, the one on the right is probably the fanciest one I've seen. Now, Wildman and Company lusted a number of other wares, and these are some faience candlesticks, which have been lusted and stamped Spano Lustra. They also, <coughs> excuse me, lusted some more utilitarian wares. I don't know how these went for wear, because as I said, the iridescent glaze lusters tend to be fairly fragile. So I would have thought that with time they would have worn and with use. But uh, these are stamped faience, and uh, the pattern books say that Chippendale was also a lusted uh, toilet set. And a very few pieces of china. Uh, the trio on the left in our collection, and the other picture came from the internet, but obviously they would appear to have done uh, tea wear, uh, some of it anyway, and the only ones I've seen are in dainty. And uh, here is a small vase, but China lust with Spano lustre on it seems to be pretty rare. There are also a few 7,000 period uh, uh, patterns. And uh, I think these are almost certainly done by Walter Slater because uh, some of the intarsio in similar styles has been attributed to him. And uh, you can see they're fairly stylized foliage patterns. Right, well, that pretty much brings us to the end of Wildman and Company. And I'd now like to talk about the Shelley period uh, from 1910 on. They seem to have been a big boom in the 1920s. Nothing that I can see that's been done in the 1930s, but some of you may be able to correct that. The art director was Walter Slater. He actually joined in the Wildman and Company period, 1905. And uh, he, in 1920s, he introduced a range of lusterware, some of them with his facsimile signature on the base. His son, Eric, also may have had a hand in designing some of them. He took over as art director eventually. Some of these are obviously just a continuation on from uh, what was being made and stamped with Wildman Company back stamps. They have late Foley and uh, they still have the Spano Lustra, but the Spano Lustra name disappeared uh, for most wares, except for these early few years. Although there are a couple of anomalies. Here is an early uh, trinket set, and uh, it is stamped with the 1916-25 back stamp. Most of it just has the back stamp, but uh, I found a pot that is obviously the same shape as, as the larger pot on the tray, and it has uh, Spano lustra and iridescent wear on it. So there are a few strange little back stamps. I've been through the pattern book to dredge out what I can find refers to lusted. And uh, the next one that gets a mention is again a 7,000 series. Uh, it's a variation of pelican pots uh, for, uh, not sorry, not a pelican pot, a uh, uh, moonlight series. And uh, instead of the dark blue that was used earlier, it has changed to a uh, turquoise, but I couldn't find an example of the pattern book page uh, example. It, obviously the pattern book page is fairly badly damaged, but I did find one on the right that uh, is the same pattern number and uh, has been lusted. The next two I could find have moved up to the eight 
thousand numbers. They just followed sequentially on from the 7,000 earthenware series. And there are two patterns in which they mention luster, and I've highlighted the mentions just to, and we'll talk about those in more detail. Vinterware, a lot of you probably have seen, and it, it says lusted over. So I presume, uh, and I don't know whether that's supposed to be luster, W luster white perhaps, but, uh, and here are some examples where a bird in a vine and most of the birds are blue with a bit of brown on the back and some orange, but the little pot in the middle uh, or the jug has uh, probably because it's small has a bird with a brown back and head and the orange seems to have disappeared. And the next one is Romanian and we can date these precisely because they were uh, registered patterns and it interestingly says lusted in violet luster, orange luster number one, yellow luster and orange luster 30. And Romanian, here are some examples. I presume that this may mean that the orange was a luster glaze in its own right and the blue on the handle and the uh, purple and so on. Uh, in other words, they would be, I guess, what you would classify as solid luster glazes rather than just luster over glazes. Now, again, in the 1920s, in the 8000s, there are some numbered powder boxes uh, using cranes and butterflies seem to be the popular motive. One unnumbered with a later back stamp. So obviously they continued making these for some time. There are also entries for three different colors of what they call faience marble effects. Uh, I've only seen pictures of the red variation, but there are supposed to be, according to the pattern books, blue and green, and they were given a pearl luster over. There's another little range, and it's usually referred to as Scottish motto luster wear because of the thistle that appears on them all and uh, some sayings, I don't know where they came from, but uh, Better buy than borrow, help yourself, things like that. East or West, home is A the best. And uh, these, I again cannot find any pattern book entries for them. Uh, there must have been a list somewhere, but perhaps it's disappeared. And there were quite a few of these in a whole range of uh, shapes and sizes. And I've thrown these in. These are a pair of vases that we have, but uh, they are pearl lusted. They're unnumbered. Uh, the pattern was originally used for cloisello and then later for Indian peony or peony, depending on how you wish to pronounce it. And there's a range in the 1920s, it's a 1927 pattern book entry for kingfishers. And these were, you'll see, lusted in tangerine. So, Let's just go one step further. The large bowl on the left is one in our collection and it was so badly worn, the luster glaze on the inside that I decided it would look better without any. And I got some toothpaste and a soft cloth and uh, polished it off. But you can see underneath that it would have originally had that tangerine luster. So that shows you the penultimate stage in production. It was printed in resist, which presumably was put on to keep the white areas white, blown in oven blue, which gave it an overall blue finish, fired, scratched, which I presume is their description for the process to remove the resist. Uh, the printed in oven blue pattern, so that must have been where they added the details to the kingfisher and the foliage. Uh, oven fired again, and then lusted in tangerine. So it was quite a, uh, a elaborate process. And a few examples of that tangerine luster. Uh, this bowl has a normal pattern inside, and on the outside, it has Chinese dragon, which is lusted. It's the only example I've been able to find of Chinese dragon lusted, but there may have been more. And a few popular patterns were also given this treatment. Surrey scenery, 
Again, a 1927 pattern book entry. And uh, there are quite a few examples of that. And uh, also uh, uh, the kingfishers. And I've thrown these in because there are a couple. This one, I haven't been able to find any source for the pattern and it doesn't have a pattern number. Uh, but they're obviously exotic birds. I don't know whether they're supposed to be swans, cranes, or herons. Uh, the beaks seem a bit short for uh, some of them. But uh, And the one on the left is, again, a bit strange. It has uh, a white base. It has some tangerine. And the black is matte, but the tangerine is uh, uh, the typical tangerine luster. So I don't quite know what was going on there either. Now, there are more pattern book entries, not a lot, but a few, which specifically mention that the wares are to be lusted. And these five vases all fall into that category. Uh, you can see uh, some of them, the luster shows up better than others. Luster is, I find, quite hard to photograph. There is a range of powder boxes. Uh, the one on the bottom right, I've put lusted question mark, but uh, Helen tells me she owns an example and that the base of it, the blue base, is, is she believes is lusted. Uh, and some of these, again, the luster doesn't show up very well in the photo, but it is hard to photograph. You either get a lot of reflections and hard to see the pattern, or if you use a light tint to kill the reflections, you also kill the shine on the luster a bit. In the large bird series, the eagle, came out as a lusted example. The eagle was made in a number of colorways, a couple of them shown on the right. But on the left, uh, the luster version seems to have been quite popular. There are a few of these around. And some other wares, unnumbered, not with Slater signs, but here's a, a pretty comport with uh, the Japanese lady scene. There are quite a few unnumbered uh, fish. I'll talk more about the fish later, uh, which uh, have uh, you know various pictures and so on, which have been given the luster treatment. And now we get to what I think are the most uh, elaborate and beautiful section: the Walter Slater ones. Walter Slater signed some of these. They're nearly all unnumbered. Uh, there are a few numbered ones, which were obviously produced in some number. And most pieces have the 1916 to 25 back stamp. Uh, but uh, there are a few with the next 1920 to 40, but I don't think any of them are made much after about 1930. Well, first, some numbered ones. Uh, there's a fish series, which was numbered. And... The number is 8306, and it was used for the ones on the left, which are white over a pale blue. And they were built up there almost quite three dimensional. There are some gold fish, as in the middle, and that gets an extra A after the number. And there are some colored fish, and they get an extra B after the number. And here's an example of a colored fish in detail. You can see that obviously they put on something to give some color that was more or less in the outline of the fish. And uh, then uh, they have done some possibly printing, but uh, certainly quite a bit of hand application of the detail. And there are quite a few. The colors aren't always the same, depending on what they'd applied and, and, and to uh, give the fish shape. And uh, these are still in the 8306B series. And a few more. So you can see the colors of the fish varied considerably. Now, there's another series where butterflies seem to have been popular. Uh, these three are all signed by Walter Slater but no pattern numbers. And if you look at the detail, the butterfly would appear to have been first applied by stamping. They obviously put, uh, put a bit of color where the butterfly was to go. And then uh, I think they've done some further outlining by and detail by hand. For example, I would believe that the dots around the body would have to have been applied by hand. 
There's a few more by which have Walter Slater signatures, the pretty vase, which it says it richly colored circles, and a couple more vases, one with the later 1925 to 40 back stamp, although I would think it still was done before 1930, and the one on the right, which is fairly geometric. Now, Walter Slater signatures appear on a large a number of bowls and plates. And I'd like to show you a few. These are two spectacular dragons in an Australian collection, the Kents. Uh, a couple of bowls now. These are both in our collection. And I know that they were produced in some numbers because we have seen others on the internet. But all unnumbered, some very attractive bowls. And another couple of bowls, the one on the left uh, has some very rich colors. And if my memory serves me correctly, I think Jerry Pierce owns that one. And some oriental scenes. And a few more geometrics, the one on the left with dragon, a dragonfly, which was also used on some other luster wear and some stylized foliage and fish. I would think these styles almost called would be regarded as Art Nouveau. Some more flowers, fairly uh, geometric, and uh, some swans. In addition to the bowls, Walter Slater signatures appear on some large pots. And here are two views of one decorated with a dragon. Quite elaborate handwork. Few more, peacock on the left, bird in the middle, if you can make it out, has been referred to as a bird of paradise, and a dragon on the right. Couple of both sides of uh, a vase decorated with oriental scenery, and another one with butterflies, a couple of fairy scenes, flower. These also ginger jars often have Walter Slater signatures. These two are the same pattern, but you'll see decorated quite differently. The one on the right, uh, much more richly colored and so on, and uh, to my mind, more attractive, but they're both beautiful in their own right. Uh, a dragonfly and a spider web. A fairy scene, which I understand is on its way to an Australian collector, and a dragon, and a few more with foliage, and uh, two sides of a fish vase with the later stamp, uh, but it has lost its lid. But since they gilded around the rim, it uh, is a, a, an attractive piece in its own right. And some heraldic patterns. Walter Slater did a few of these. Uh, they mostly seem to feature lions. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether they're done as exhibition pieces. The one in the middle would appear to be a ginger jar that has lost its lid uh, and uh, a large bowl. Right, well, that's about all the pictures I can find. I'd just like to finish with a closing summary. First of all, uh, most of Wildman and Shelley's lusted glazes are the thin translucent overglaze type, and they are easily damaged, and they were used on wares intended, I think, for decoration rather than for utilitarian use, although surprisingly there are some toilet sets and some dainty china, which received this treatment. But most of the lusted items are in there. In the Wildman and Company backstamp period, all the lusted pieces seem to be stamped Spano Lustra, except for what I think may be a couple of misstamps that are just Intarsio. A 3000 series using Intarsio patterns and numbers, but in different colorways. The Arts and Crafts 10,000 series, a bit of faience, including some toilet sets, candlesticks, and so on, a few china pieces, and then a few 7,000 numbers 
which are later in the sequence, and I think uh, after Walter Slater joined Wildman and Company. And the Shelley stamps, no patent book entries for any lustreware after 1927, but there, and there are a number of numbered patents with iridescent overglazes, a few early ones marked Spano Lustra, and a few of the numbered patents have a Walter Slater stamp, in particular the fish ones, and a few vases. In the unnumbered wares, there are Scottish model ware and a big range attributed to Walter Slater. Many of the loveliest pieces have his facsimile signature, and some seem to be one-offs. Which brings me to the end.